Welcome to a new episode from Perfect English Podcast. And now we move to the place where we have stories. And to be honest, this is my favorite place, especially when it comes to Greek mythology, which is our question for today. And our question for today is, who was Jason? I'm sure everybody knows about Hercules, maybe Perseus because of the movies we have, and Achilles, of course, if you've watched Troy, but not a lot know about Jason, one of the major Greek heroes from Greek mythology. So let's learn more about the son of Aeson. Now, Jason in Greek mythology, who was a son of Aeson, a king in Greece, Aeson's throne had been taken away from him by his half-brother Peleus. And Jason, the rightful heir to the throne, had been sent away as a child for his own protection. When Jason grew to manhood, however, he courageously returned to Greece to regain his kingdom. Pelias pretended to be willing to relinquish the crown, but said that the young man must first undertake the quest of the Golden Fleece, which was the rightful property of their family. Pelias did not believe that Jason could succeed in the quest, nor that he would come back alive. But the young man scoffed at the dangers ahead, Jason assembled a crew of heroic young men from all parts of Greece to sail with him on the ship Argo. After a voyage of incredible perils, the Argonauts reached Colchis, the country in which the Golden Fleece was held by King Aetus. Aetus agreed to give up the Golden Fleece if Jason would yoke two fire-breathing bulls with bronze feet and sow the teeth of the dragon that Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, had long before slain. From the teeth would spring up a crop of armed men who would turn against Jason. Jason successfully accomplished this task with the aid of Medea, the king's daughter. Unknown to Jason, the goddess Hera had intervened in his behalf by making Medea fall in love with him. Medea gave Jason a charm to sprinkle on his weapons that would make him invincible for the day of his ordeal and helped him steal the fleece that night by charming a sleepless dragon that guarded it. In return for her help, Jason promised to love Medea always and to marry her as soon as they were safely back in Greece. Carrying the fleece and accompanied by Medea, Jason and his crew managed to escape from Aetis. On reaching Greece, the crew of heroes disbanded and Jason with Medea took the Golden Fleece to Pelias. In Jason's absence, Pelias had forced Jason's father to kill himself, and his mother had died of grief. To avenge their death, Jason called upon Medea to help him punish Pelias. Medea tricked Pelias' daughters into killing their father, and then she and Jason went to Corinth, where two sons were born to them. Instead of feeling grateful to Medea for all she had done, Jason treacherously married the daughter of the king of Corinth. In her grief and despair, Medea employed more sorcery to kill the young bride. Next, fearing that her young sons might be left alone for strangers to mistreat, she killed them. When the furious Jason determined to kill her, she escaped in a chariot drawn by dragons. So it is a story of killing and treachery, but that is most of the stories we have from the Greek mythology. And the beauty of Greek mythology is that most of the stories we have from those olden times are still being used today in modern movies, and they are used in a lot of fantasy novels. Maybe not directly, but a lot of the stories are assembled from here and there, sometimes from different myths that come from different parts of the world, and are put in one place in a novel or in a film, or sometimes in a series, like the famous Game of Thrones. And now we come to our unforgettable people section, and our question for today is who was Alan Turing? If you haven't seen The Imitation Game yet, it's a movie obviously, if you haven't seen it yet, definitely go and see it, one of the must-see movies. It talks a lot about the life of Alan Turing, a man known in the scientific world a long time before the movie came out, and the secrets that were held from the public for a long time were not revealed until very recently. So let's learn more about who Alan Turing was. Alan Turing was born in 1912 and died in 1954. He was a British mathematician who was considered one of the most important founders of computer science and artificial intelligence. He was the first to describe in detail a machine that could carry out mathematical operations and solve equations. His work brought together symbolic logic, numerical analysis, electrical engineering, and mechanical vision of human thought processes. 
Alan Matheson Turing was born in London. He had a conventional school education. Early on, he developed a passion for science. He became a student in mathematics, but also gathered ideas from philosophy and physics. Early letters show how a concern for the problem of the mind was given emotional weight by the death of a dearly loved school friend. In 1935, Turing entered King's College at Cambridge University. Inspired by problems left outstanding by the work of Kurt Gödel in the foundation of mathematics, Turing began combining symbolic logic with an original analysis of mental activity. His paper on computable numbers in 1937 introduced the abstract Turing machine to define the concept of a fixed computational method or algorithm. He also introduced the universal Turing machine. A single machine capable of performing any instructions given to it. He thereby solved the major mathematical problem called decidability. His work opened up the new theory of computability, which means what a computing device can do, and laid out the principles of the modern computer. He earned his PhD at Princeton University in the United States in 1938, then returned to England. Turing's mathematical career was overtaken by World War II. That happened from 1939 to 1945. He became a cryptographer for the British Foreign Office and excelled at applying scientific ideas to code breaking, which is cryptography. Most famously, he constructed a machine to help break the German naval Enigma cipher. His successful deciphering of the code provided a tool to track German ships in the Atlantic, an advantage critical to the victory of the Allies in the war. Turing was awarded the Order of the British Empire for his work. In 1946, Turing used his experience with electronic technology to translate his abstract universal Turing machine into a detailed design for a digital computer. American researchers had already made similar proposals, but Turing's design was far ahead in grasping the scope of new technology. The National Physical Laboratory, where he was working, failed to take practical steps to build his proposed machine. In 1948, Turing moved to the University of Manchester to pioneer the use of the computer developed there. Turing held that a computer was capable, in principle, of doing anything that the brain can do. His 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, set forth a theory that remains a cornerstone of the science of artificial intelligence. The test that Turing proposed involved a computer communicating with human judges via a teleprinter link. If the computer's responses to questions were indistinguishable from those of a human being, Turing claimed the computer should be regarded as exhibiting intelligence. The Turing test for machine intelligence had a lasting influence in the philosophy of mind and still provokes discussion. In 1951, Turing was named a fellow of the Royal Society. The next year, he began to publish his work on the mathematical aspects of pattern and form development in living organisms. Events in Turing's personal life effectively ended his career. However, in 1952, he stood trial for having had a homosexual relationship, which was considered a crime in Britain back then. He was classed as a security risk and accepted injections of estrogen to avoid imprisonment. He was open about his homosexuality and unashamed of it. However, homosexuality was then considered a mental illness, and he sought Jungian therapy. In 1954, Turing died of cyanide poisoning. Although the circumstances of his death were not clear, the verdict was suicide. So it was not exactly how it was brought up in the movie. But it is pretty close. And remember, when you watch the story of somebody's life on TV in a movie or something, it always exaggerates some parts and it overlooks some other parts to create this dramatic effect that will serve the movie. But anyway, it was pretty close, and it is a, an excellent movie if you want to watch it. I hope you have learned a lot today, and I'm pretty sure that your English is a step closer to perfect English. This was your host, Danny. I'll see you next time.